All right, here we are in section 2.4 of the Campbell textbook talking about chemical reactions and um, this should be a pretty quick section. It's pretty short, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about the terminology and we're all familiar with the terms that we're going to be using. So uh, let's jump right in. Chemical reactions. So you've learned about this in your chemistry class, but chemical reactions are uh, reactions where your chemicals, your starting materials, are changing in some chemical way. It's different from um, like a physical change. A chemical change involves a change in the actual chemicals that are involved. And so that means that bonds, chemical bonds, are either, they're, they're oftentimes made and they're oftentimes broken. Um, and so when we talk about a chemical reaction, uh, we talk about the starting materials, um, the things that are, are reacting, that we're starting with, um, as one might imagine, we call those our reactants. Those are the things that will react. Um, and we can write them in their molecular formulas like we have written here, like an H2 and an O2. We can, if we want to, draw it out um, to help ourselves visualize it, although that's not usually um, done uh, unless you need to show uh, exactly what the molecules or the respective substances look like. Um, then, instead of having an equal sign, we use this arrow, sometimes called a yield arrow, um, and that, that indicates that that is a reaction taking place, and that arrow is always pointing to what is being made in your chemical reaction, what is being produced in your chemical reaction, and that's why we call those things the products, okay? So the reactants are your starting materials, your products are your final products, what you're, what you're ending up with in your chemical reaction, okay? And the concept that you learned about before when you're balancing chemical equations in chemistry class is this concept of matter being conserved, right? Conserved meaning that um, it's not being lost, it's not being created, you have the same that you had before. And so when we talk about conservation of matter or when we talk about conservation of mass, it is this idea that matter cannot be created or destroyed. And that might seem pretty straightforward, um, but the way that it manifests, the way that we see it in chemical reactions is however many um, atoms of a particular element we have as our reactants, we must also have in a different form, but nonetheless in our products, right? So here we see that we have one, two, three, four hydrogen atoms uh, in our reactants. And here in our products we see we have one, two, three, four um, hydrogen atoms in our products, right? So that was con the matter was conserved there. And we can do the same with our oxygen atoms, okay? So make sure you keep that in mind when you come across chemical reactions. Um, I don't think we need to get into balancing them too much here. Um, I have a video about that if you're interested in it. Okay, um, moving on to our next slide. So in biology, we'll talk about a number of chemical reactions, um, and there are some pretty important ones that we will go into quite a bit of depth about. And so, uh, one reaction that's really important is the reaction that uh, is used for photosynthesis. You'll remember that photosynthesis is the process that um, mostly plants go through uh, to uh, use light energy to make molecules of glucose or molecules that they can use for energy, right? So they... Uh, use materials from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, they also use water, and they make these high energy molecules. So here we have that reaction written out, right? So we have in our reactants side of the equation, we have carbon dioxide right here. It's reacting with water, H2O. We have our yield arrow, so it's showing that this is your reactants, here are your products. Um, and we're making, in this equation we have it written out as, this is glucose, one molecule of glucose, and of course we're also making a bunch of oxygen molecules, diatomic oxygen. And so in these uh, chemical equations we have 
numbers sometimes in front of our um, various substances, right? So we have a six here in front of the carbon dioxide, and that means that you need six CO2 molecules to react with six oxygen molecules to get one. There's no number in front of this one, but when we don't have a number, it's sort of like an algebra. It's, you can imagine that there's a one there. Otherwise, there wouldn't be anything written there if there wasn't a one. Um, so you six carbon dioxide molecules react with six oxygen molecules to make one glucose molecule and also six oxygen molecules. And that is a ratio that we need to get our products. Um, it's not noted here in this equation, um, but the only reason this reaction happens at the rate that we see it happen is because it gets enough light energy um, to allow that to happen. So with the light energy, this reaction will go um, forward. It turns out though, there are a lot of reactions that go forwards, but they also go in reverse. And it's all dependent on the amount of reactants and the amount of products that you have, as well as other conditions um, like temperature and pressure that will affect whether your reaction is going forward more or whether it's going back more. And what you really just need to know is that this concept exists, that there are some reactions that are um, reversible. Again, reverse meaning backwards, right? So if something is going forward, um, it's going the way that we've been talking about reactions, the arrow is pointing to the products. However, if it's going in the reverse, it's going the other way. So you are making your reactants. Um, and there are some reactions that will um, make products, but they will also go back and make their reactants. So a classic example of this is the reaction between nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia. So we have N2 reacting with H2 and it's making ammonia NH3. And so that reaction can go in the forward direction, but it also can go backwards where this ammonia is breaking down into hydrogen and nitrogen. And um, it turns out that um, you need high pressure to make your um, product in this particular chemical reaction. And there's, I have a diagram here of like how ammonia is made. Um, I don't think we need to go into it too much, but it's a Haber process. Um, and they create this compressed kind of environment so that the ammonia, or sorry, the nitrogen and the hydrogen are reacting to make this desirable product, ammonia, which is very useful um, for a variety of applications, especially in agriculture. And when we talk about reversible reactions, we talk about chemical equilibrium. Um, and, you know, this word equilibrium you probably came across before, but it, um, it refers to uh, kind of like a balance that will exist. And a chemical equilibrium is talking about the rate of reaction, so how much um, of a particular product is being made. And when our chemical equation reaches this equilibrium, it means that the rate of whatever forward reaction is happening is the same rate as the reverse reaction. So you're making, so like exam, for example, in this Haber process here, in this reaction that we were talking about before, you're making, um, well, you're making ammonia, NH3, at the same rate that you're making hydrogen and nitrogen, right? So I'm not saying you're making the same amount of them, I'm saying that it's the same rate. So whatever you're making is actually breaking back down into what it came from at the same rate, at the same speed, okay? So just be familiar with this idea of chemical equilibrium, okay? So I think that's all I want to talk about there. I have a question, oops, that's not what I want to do, um, to kind of check our understanding of that one. Um, so. Speaking of chemical equilibrium, uh, this is the type of question that you might come across um, on your exam. So uh, which of the following uh, scenarios here describes chemical equi equilibrium? Take a moment to read through these. 
I'm going to go over the answers now. Hopefully you've chosen an answer. Um, so we're going to go through process of elimination here. So for A, there are concentrations of reactants and product, and the reactions have stopped. And this is a lot of times a misconception that people have, that at equilibrium, everything is balanced, and now suddenly like the reaction has stopped because you have a balance between the products and the reactants. But that is not true um, in chemical equilibrium. The reaction is still going forward and reverse, right? So it's not stopped. Um, B, the reaction stopped only when all the reactants have been converted into products, right? That is actually the case for a irreversible reaction, right? So if you only, um, your reaction doesn't really go back, it doesn't reverse, um, once you use up all of your reactants, then the reaction will stop, right? If you're burning something, as soon as you run out of stuff to burn, then that particular combustion reaction has stopped, um, and it's the end of the reaction. But this is not the case for chemical equilibrium, right? So this one that's here is a case of an irreversible. I can't read my handwriting. Chemical reaction. Okay, so reaction. Oh, good. So that's not what we're looking for. C, forward and reverse reactions have stopped so that the concentrations of the products um, equal the, con sorry, the concentration of the reactants equal the concentration of products. Again, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about a stopped reaction. Um, so D, the forward and the reverse reactions continue with no effect on the concentration of the reactants and the products, right? And so that is referring to this idea that the forward and the reverse rate are happening um, at the same, and you are making as much of the reactants as you are um, getting rid of the products. And so your answer there is D. Um, so that's all I think I wanted to talk about. Um, make sure you do some review of these questions and I'll see you in the next video.